Hey, welcome to FISM News. I'm Samuel Case. And I'm Renata Kish. And tonight, Biden rejects the possibility of pardoning Hunter. Meanwhile, Trump ally Stephen Bannon is sent to prison. And Israel defends striking a school in Gaza. Well, with Hunter Biden's gun trial in full swing, President Biden is now promising not to pardon his son if he ends up being convicted. Here's Biden. As we sit here in Normandy, uh, your son Hunter is on trial, and I know that you cannot speak about an ongoing uh, federal prosecution. But let me ask you, will you accept the jury's outcome, their verdict, no matter what it is? Yes. And have you ruled out a pardon for your son? Yes. That was Biden speaking to ABC's David Muir yesterday. Hunter is accused of lying on a gun application about his drug addiction back in 2018. Hunter's trial began on Monday, less than a week after Trump's conviction in New York in what Trump has called a rigged trial. During yesterday's interview, Biden accused Trump of undermining the rule of law. Stop undermining the rule of law. Stop undermining the institutions. That's what this whole effort is. All the MAGA Republicans are coming out saying this was a fix, this was a jury that, was, that, that this was a, a judge that set up to get Trump. There's no evidence of any of that, none. He's trying to undermine it. Look, he got a fair trial. The jury spoke like they speak in all cases, and it should be respected. Meanwhile, the Republican National Committee is receiving backlash for their misleading videos of Biden. The RNC shared multiple videos of the president looking confused and disoriented in Normandy yesterday. But the moment that got most people's attention was when he seemingly tried to sit down in a chair that didn't seem to exist. Now, the White House responded to these videos as baseless. They referenced a PolitiFact article that sought to debunk some of these viral videos. And they were wrong. The president did indeed have a chair behind him where he tried to sit down, but then he seemingly changed his mind as Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's name was announced. Distinguished guests, please welcome the Honorable Lloyd J. Austin III, Secretary of Defense of the United States of America. PolitiFact also corrected RNC's claim that Biden left the event early without greeting veterans was likewise false. Just before he leaves, the video shows Biden shaking hands with veterans alongside French President Macron. However, there is no denying that Biden confuses dates, names of people, and is frequently seen guided by others. Something we covered quite a bit on yesterday's show. In case you missed that, you might want to check that out. Uh, meanwhile, on the other side of the aisle, Donald Trump is partially walking back his promise of revenge if he's reelected. During his recent interview with uh, Dr. Phil this week, the former president said he'd be okay with not retaliating against his political opponents in his second term. What if when you win this election, you said, enough is enough. Too much is too much. This is a race to the bottom and it stops here. It stops now. What if you took that approach? I'm okay with that. I am. I'm okay with that. Following Trump's conviction in New York, some conservatives have been pushing for Republicans to respond in kind by legally targeting Democrats. Meanwhile, Trump, for his part, has previously promised retribution if he's reelected. In 2016, I declared, I am your voice. Today, I add, I am your warrior. I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. I am your retribution. I'm not going to let this happen. That was Trump speaking at CPAC back in 2023. Now, Trump says his revenge will mainly come through political success, though he's not completely closing the door to other forms of payback. Retribution is going to be through success. We're going to make it very successful. We have to bring the country together. I think you, you have so much to do, you don't have time to get even. You only have time to get right. Well, revenge does take time, I will say that. It does. And sometimes revenge can be justified, Phil. I have to be honest. You no, know, sometimes it can. 
Meanwhile, Trump is reportedly starting to vet potential VP picks as well. According to NBC and ABC, those who received paperwork include North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, Florida Senator Marco Rubio, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, and South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. But other potential picks were Florida Representative Byron Donalds, New York Representative Elise Stefanik, and Trump's 2016 rival Ben Carson. However, according to some insiders, Trump's list is not fixed by any means, and changes could happen at any moment. Trump campaign spokesperson Brian Hughes said in a statement, quote, anyone claiming to know who or when President Trump will choose his VP is lying unless that person is named Donald J. Trump. The former president said he will likely announce his pick at the RNC convention next month. And a federal judge yesterday ordered former Trump advisor Steve Bannon to report to prison on July 1st to begin serving out a four-month sentence. Bannon was convicted of contempt charges back in 2022 for failing to comply with a subpoena from the January 6th committee. Bannon's sentence originally had been stayed pending appeal. The stay was reversed this week after a higher court ultimately rejected his appeal efforts. Speaking out the, outside the courthouse uh, yesterday, Bannon said his conviction was was part of ongoing efforts to silence conservatives. I want to say something specifically about the Justice Department. Merrick Garland, Lisa Monaco, the entire Justice Department, they're not going to shut up Trump. They're not going to shut up Navarro. They're not going to shut up Bannon. And they're certainly not going to shut up MAGA. All of this, besides the major legal issues that have to be addressed, all of this is about one thing. This is about shutting down the MAGA movement, shutting down grassroots conservatives, shutting down President Trump. Bannon is now vowing to appeal the ruling all the way to the Supreme Court if he has to. Meanwhile, the House passed the first of its 12 annual spending bills yesterday, starting the 2025 budget battle. Republicans and Democrats already disagree on measures brought to the table in the military construction and veterans affairs bill. And that's usually the least controversial of the budget bills, but only four Democrats voted in favor of this year's addition. Meanwhile, the GOP rejected amendments that would see taxpayer funding used for transgender services or abortions. President Joe Biden has issued a veto warning saying Republicans are abandoning last year's budget compromise deal. Congressman Michael Guest accused the president of prioritizing liberal policies over veterans. This veto threat shows that our president cares more about liberal policies than he does about honoring the promise that we have made our veterans. I hope and I believe that all members should support this legislation and that the House will stand with our veterans who have sacrificed to serve and protect this great nation we call home. And we'll get into international news when we come back from this break. There are moments in life that define us. Choices determine the courses we take. Choices that create life or those that save a life. And some make life worthwhile. There are decisions to stay or to go, to remain the same or to grow. Sometimes we pray and make peace. Other times we take a stand for what we believe. In celebration, mourning, triumph and defeat, we are invested in every decision we seek. Despite differences, we have one thing in common, the desire to do all for the glory of God. Keep your wallet aligned with your heart and your investments in harmony with your faith. Timothy Plan, biblically responsible mutual funds, ETFs, and retirement plans. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at timothyplan.com. Read carefully before investing. Do you know what you are supporting when you purchase mutual funds and stocks? Think about it. When you invest in a company, you make a decision to support the things that that company supports. And it may not be things that you agree with. Financial Issues is a ministry teaching people like you how to invest biblically, responsibly, keeping your investments clear of companies that may support an ungodly agenda. Learn more by going to financialissues.org. Financialissues.org. But I felt very comfortable in that decision because I found a lot of support. Like everyone here, like always made sure, like keep in contact with me. This is what um, ultimately changed my decision. You know, knowing that I had all this support that I didn't know I had. 
now that he's here and he's four months old, like I look at him and I honestly like, it just makes me want to cry. Like, um, Welcome back to FISM News, I'm Renata Kish. Well, let's start with Israel. GOP leader Speaker Mike Johnson and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell announced that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will address Congress on July 24th. Democrat Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer likewise will welcome the invitation. Netanyahu responded in a statement, quote, I am very moved to have the privilege of representing Israel before houses of both houses of Congress and to prevent the truth and uh, to present the truth about our just war against those who seek to destroy us and the entire world. He also posted on X yesterday, quote, the state of Israel is in a difficult battle on many fronts. We are fighting in the south. We are fighting in the north. We're also fighting here in Judea and Samaria. Netanyahu added that this comes amid difficult international pressures exerted on the country. President Biden has been increasingly critical of Israel's operation in Gaza, despite the IDF not crossing any so-called red lines. It's unclear whether the prime minister will meet with Biden in July. And let's turn our attention to the war itself, where Israel is defending its strike on a U.N. school in central Gaza yesterday, saying it was a targeted strike on Hamas terrorists who participated in October 7th. Here's IDF spokesman Daniel Hagari with more details. Our precise strike was based on concrete intelligence from multiple sources. The terrorists inside this school were planning more attacks against Israelis, some of them imminent. We stopped a ticking time bomb. Hagari says they ultimately killed nine Hamas members in that strike. Meanwhile, Hamas, for its part, is claiming that 33 people were killed in the attack, including women and children. However, Hagari said the IDF was careful to make sure no women and children were in the classrooms at the time of the strike. We delayed our strike twice because we identified civilians in the area. We had aerial surveillance that, been, that had been monitoring the Hamas compound for a few days. We conducted the strike once our intelligence and surveillance indicated that there were no women or children inside the Hamas compound, inside those classrooms. The school was run by the UNRWA, or UNRWA, that's a UN agency Israel has accused many times of having ties to Hamas. Israel accused 14 of its members earlier this year of having alleged ties to October 7th. Last month, Israel also shared a video allegedly showing Hamas terrorists inside an UNRWA compound in Rafah. That video emerged after a UN investigation said the agency did not appear to be compromised by Hamas. Meanwhile, Yemen's Houthi rebels revealed a new solid fuel missile on Wednesday that has some hypersonic features. It's called the Palestine missile, and its use of solid fuel allows it to be set up and launched quicker than liquid fuel missiles. That means a shorter window of opportunity for the U.S. and coalition forces to take out the launching site. The rebels launched it toward the Israeli port of Eilat, but no damage was reported. The new weapon shares similarities with the Iranian Conqueror, a weapon that Tehran claims can travel 15 times faster than the speed of sound. Iran says it did not break a UN arms embargo but by providing the weapon to the Houthis. Meanwhile, the Islamic resistance in Iraq claims they worked with the, Houthi, uh, with the Houthis to attack Israel's Haifa port yesterday. Israel said they were unfamiliar with that incident. Meanwhile, we turn to some very tragic news coming out of Sudan, where 150 people were massacred by a militant group that is currently fighting the nation's army. It's believed 35 children are currently among the dead, with some reports suggesting the death toll there could be as high as 200 people. The Rapid Support Forces militia has been waging a bloody civil war for the last 14 months in Sudan. It denies the massacre of civilians, but a spokesman said they were conducting military operations near the town where it took place. The militia is already accused of repeated human rights violations, including crimes against children.
Truly tragic there. Meanwhile, officials from Cuba announced this week that they would be hosting Russian warships for planned joint exercises. According to the Cuban Foreign Ministry, the joint military exercises are scheduled between June 12th and June 17th. The ministry said in a statement that none of the vessels will be carrying nuclear weapons and that it does not represent a threat to the region. Washington officials told reporters that although they were not informed of the, drill, of the drills, they are aware of the Russian vessels and have been tracking their movements. They described the presence of Russian naval vessels in the Americas as notable but not concerning. The Russian ships are expected to stay in the region following their deals with uh, drills with Cuba, reportedly planning to make a port call in Venezuela. U.S. officials believe the exercises are part of an effort by Russia to retaliate against a U.S. support of Ukraine. And that comes as the U.S., Japan and South Korea launched their first joint Coast Guard drills off the coast of Japan yesterday in a show of strength against Chinese aggression. The exercises are part of a much larger effort to strengthen maritime forces in the region following an agreement signed last August. In recent years, Japan has strengthened its presence around disputed islands as China's Coast Guard has been seen in Japanese waters. But most recently, Chinese vessels have also engaged in skirmishes with the Philippines as well. That's a longtime U.S. ally, and those skirmishes have further heightened fears of possible armed conflict between the U.S. and China. All right, and we have plenty more news coming up next, but first, let's go to Seth Udinsky for a moment in history. Welcome back to A Moment in History. I'm Seth Udinsky. In our journey through the annals of history, let's take a turn towards theology and church history and look at arguably the greatest theologian in the Western Hemisphere. This man was famous for several things. His profound belief in the sovereignty of God, one of the most famous sermons in American church history in which he spoke of God's righteous anger at sinners, and his missionary work to the Mohican Indian tribe. Let's explore the first great American preacher, Jonathan Edwards. Edwards was born in what would become the state of Connecticut in 1703. He was an outstanding student, but the pivotal moment in his life came when he was 17 years old. Not unlike Martin Luther before him, Edwards was saved through the studying and reading of God's word, specifically the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, which says, To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Edwards was overcome with the sovereign grace of God in the gospel, and his life was never the same. He would serve as a pastor for the remainder of his life, and not long into his pastoral ministry, he wrote his most famous sermon, a fiery and bold exploration of God's righteous anger against sinners titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. While many have criticized Edwards' words as being overtly mean or hostile, his sermon paints an accurate and utterly beautiful picture of the wrath sinners deserve and simultaneously the beautiful grace that God has given to those who love him through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Edwards, along with his friend and colleague George Whitfield, was instrumental in the first great awakening in the American colonies, which was a spiritual revival of sound biblical preaching which saw thousands convert to faith in Jesus Christ. Later in life, Edwards would serve as missionary pastor to the local Stockbridge Mohican Indian tribe. He also enjoyed over 30 years of a wonderfully fruitful and loving marriage to his wife, Sarah, which he described later in life as an uncommon union. He and Sarah had 11 children together. Sources also tell us that he was an avid lover of chocolate. Edwards passed away from complications after having received a vaccine and entered glory on March 22nd, 1758 at the age of 55. Thanks so much for joining me once again for a moment in history. On the day I found I was pregnant, I was full of emotions and I just was so overwhelmed and I don't know if I'm ready for this huge life altering, changing commitment. I had individuals around me not wanting me to have this child. And somehow, and I was driving and I saw the Women's Help Center sign and I immediately turned in. That just took relief off of me. And I was like, you know what? It's gonna be okay. They gave me the confidence and the support that I needed to be able to go out and face the world. First time I held Finnegan, I just lit up with joy. I was so excited. This little boy that I had in my life, he is loving and generous. 
watching him just grow and flourish into this incredible human being has just been so rewarding and so uplifting. Looking back, I don't know what I would do without him because I needed him more than I think he needed me. The postmodern age, the Enlightenment, the Renaissance to a degree, and certainly the classical period seem to be popular candidates for secular historians to praise. On the contrary, there's one time period in history that has been slain in the street, especially by secular historians. It is a time, they argue, that history is largely forgotten and sort of just gave way to barbarism and bloodshed, a period known to us as the Dark Ages. To watch more episodes of A Moment in History, go to FISM.TV. Welcome back to FISM News. Well, let's continue with some national coverage here. Accused Long Island serial killer Rex Hoyerman was charged with two additional murders yesterday. His alleged victim count now stands at six after authorities added Jessica Taylor and Sandra Costilla to the list. The women's remains were discovered on the island in 2003 and 1993, respectively. Authorities used DNA testing on hair recovered from Taylor and Costilla's bodies to link to the 60 year old suspect. Additionally, they announced the discovery of an encrypted computer hard drive that appears to contain a murder blueprint. Hoyerman has been in jail since July for his connection to the murder of four women. However, there are ties to nearly a dozen other bodies found along Ocean Parkway beginning in the 1990s. Now, where the fallout continues from the anti-Israel protests on college campuses as this week a group of Jewish students filed a lawsuit against UCLA for failing to stop protesters from setting up what they described as a Jew exclusion zone on campus. This spring, demonstrators caused mass disruption at UCLA, setting up encampments and barring Jewish students from certain parts of the school. Take a look. We are UCLA students. I have my ID right here. I'm being blocked off. Not by the security guard, but by you two. You three. Oh, look, they're making their burger while I'm going this way. Excuse me. This is what they do. Everybody, look at this. Look at this. I'm a UCLA student. I deserve to go here. We pay tuition. This is our school. And they're not letting me walk in. The lawsuit says UCLA effectively segregated Jewish students by preventing them from accessing the heart of the campus, including classroom buildings and the main undergraduate library. On top of that, to make matters worse, they also say the school encouraged this behavior by telling security guards to, quote, discourage unapproved students from attempting to cross through the areas blocked by the activists. UCLA says it's aware of this lawsuit and that it will respond in due course. Very upsetting. Meanwhile, federal regulators are planning antitrust investigations into major tech companies. The U.S. Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission have agreed to look into Microsoft, OpenAI, and NVIDIA for these activities. According to Reuters, Microsoft and NVIDIA dominate the market, with NVIDIA valued at over $3 trillion. But the biggest concern is how these companies train their AI models and how AI affects creative work and merger review processes. The DOJ and the FTC's joint investigation is nothing new. In 2019, the agencies targeted Meta, Amazon, Google and Apple for potential antitrust violations as well. Those cases are still ongoing and the companies deny wrongdoing. And still in some business-related news, if you've looked around lately, you might be seeing fewer Pride-themed promotions than the past couple years. FISM's Ian Patrick is here to explain exactly why. Well, in case you were unaware, we're now in the middle of June, which usually means that many companies will be displaying rainbow pride merchandise and theming. But ever since the backlash against companies such as Bud Light and Target, some of these companies might actually be considering an ease-off approach when it comes to Pride Month. The biggest indication of this change in tactic seems to come from a report issued by USA Today. According to Matt Scalarud, president of Pink Media, quote, Especially during Pride season, most companies like ours are pretty busy working on Pride projects. I can tell you for myself, I have not been, and I think that's across the board. Later on, Scalarud says the following, quote, Ever since Target and Bud Light had their fiascos last year, a tremendous number of brands have decided it would be better to sit on the sidelines and let this sort itself out. In other words, it appears as though the conservative organized boycotts against companies with Pride Month promotions seems to have worked in some capacity. 
Companies including the ones I just mentioned and others such as Nike and the North Face have noticeably scaled back on Pride Month promotions. And it's even seeping into the world of sports. Last year, major sporting organizations such as Major League Baseball and the National Hockey League faced criticism for its promotion of Pride-themed items. The MLB and NHL both took measures to reduce certain aspects of their Pride-related promotions after it was met with criticism and backlash. And while that sort of scaled back pride initiative has not been as prioritized in other sporting leagues, individual teams might be getting the message. For example, upon the start of Pride Month this year, only 21 of the National Football League's 32 teams sent a message commemorating the event. The other 11 teams simply had no comment. And while that did not convey opposition to Pride Month or the beginning of it, their silence was certainly noted by fans and reporters alike. However, it does seem that some entities are still going forward with their Pride-themed promotions, and others are even doubling down on the agenda altogether. For example, Levi Strauss announced that they would continue selling Pride-themed products, and even they would donate $100,000 to an organization that promotes the LGBTQ agenda worldwide. Similarly, Wells Fargo defiantly stated that it, quote, will continue to celebrate the month as well. But these companies might be in for a tough time, and not just because of boycotts. According to an Axios survey, companies which push measures focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which can sometimes include pride-themed things, had seen significant reputation declines when it came to consumer trust. On the other hand, companies which had avoided that part of the culture war, as well as those who are considered traditionally conservative-leaning, witnessed a spike in their corporate reputation as of late. This is Ian Patrick reporting for FISM News. Thanks for that report, Ian. And lastly, some Christian families are suing Vermont for allegedly kicking them out of the foster care system. Two couples filed a lawsuit against the Vermont Department for Children and Families, accusing the agency of removing their foster care licenses because of their Christian beliefs. The lawsuit says, quote, the department recently decided to exclude all families with traditional religious beliefs about human sexuality from fostering or adopting any child. The state asked these parents if they would take a child to a pride parade or use preferred pronouns for their children, to which the couples replied no. The state then deemed the parents unfit for foster care. One of the parents, Brian Wooty, said he was very surprised by the state's decision since they were always in good standing with the system. In 2022, a caseworker said she probably could not handpick a more wonderful foster family. And, you know, it really is such a shame because we've been mm -hmm. seeing a lot of this, especially in the Northeast, sadly, where they're basically saying, you know, it'd be better that this child doesn't have a home than right. uh, that we'd rather them just not have a home entirely if they can't go to a pride parade or have whatever their wannabe pronoun is. It's very sad. Exactly. And it could be potentially dangerous, too. Like, who who are these kids going to? Mm -hmm. Are they going to un more untrustworthy parents or... Who just know, who just know, say the right just thing. Know, that's a good point. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of concerning. Learning too. Very scary. Well, that's our program for today. Thank you so much for joining us and please visit FISMnews.tv for more content. And for more updates until Monday, you can follow us on social media or you can also download the FISM app and take us wherever you go this weekend. Thanks so much. God bless. And like I said, we'll see you on Monday with more news.